This week in lab we are doing a Grignard reaction and we are going to first make the Grignard reagent that we're going to use. We're going to take bromobenzene and react with magnesium metal. Now we've discussed this in lecture already. Magnesium has two electrons in its outermost shell. It loves to give up those two electrons so they can have a filled outer shell. So it's gonna transfer one electron to the bromobenzene. We call this a set reaction. That was single electron transfer. It transferred one electron to the bromobenzene. This gives us a radical anion, and the magnesium now is a radical cation. Now, radical anion is not very stable. This is going to break apart. gives us a phenyl radical and a bromine anion. That magnesium there is going to add to the radical. It's magnesium has got its one electron and it will add to that radical. And now the bromine anion of course would just bind to the Magnesium, and then that gives us our phenyl magnesium bromide. So that's our grain yard reagent that we're going to be using this week. Now the reaction is done in hydro in anhydrous diethyl ether. <clears throat> anhydrous, of course, means it's dry, has no water in it. Grain yard reagents are good nucleophiles, and we're, we are going to be using as a nucleophile this week, but they're also very strong bases. So you need to avoid any acidic protons. In particular, water, any water that's around. So the glassware that you use this week is going to have to be dried glassware. Now I had the lab assistant go around to each kit. Uh, She's already pulled out a reaction tube out of everybody's kit and placed in the oven so that we're ready to go when we get into the lab. So uh, you've already got a dry reaction tube. Uh, we're also going to be using a dry vial. We already have those in the oven. So they're ready to go once we get in there. But let's take a look at what would happen if any water is around. This is a reaction we want to avoid. If we have that green yard reagent around in the presence of water, water has an acidic proton, and again the green yard is a very strong base. Green yards, any organometallics that we're dealing with, the green yards or the organolithiums. We talked about partial negative on the carbon attached to the metal, partial positive on the metal. Of course, with the acid, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so there's partial negative on the oxygen, partial positive on those hydrogens. So it's this carbon here with the partial negative is going to come and grab the acidic proton and we'll leave the electrons there on the oxygen. So all we have accomplished is we've destroyed our grain yard and made benzene as a byproduct we have a magnesium salt as a byproduct but we've just made benzene we've destroyed the grain yard made benzene well you can buy benzene that's a common solvent there's no reason to make it. You've just wasted your grain yard. So you need to make certain that everything remains dry. And I'll come back to that in the procedure here when I discuss it. 
Let's take a look at our actual grain yard reaction that we're going to be doing this week. So once you have the grain yard reagent made, we are going to be reacting it with benzophenone. Again, we'll do the reaction in in anhydrous diethyl ether. That does need to be anhydrous. Need it dry. The green yard reagent we just talked about: partial positive on the metal, partial negative on that carbon attached to it. The carbonyl group, because of the resonance, we have partial positive on the carbonyl carbon, partial ne partial negative on that oxygen. That green yard. That carbon here attached to the metal with the partial negative, it is attracted to the partial positive of the carbonyl. We get a nucleophilic attack at that carbonyl. To avoid breaking the octet rule, we kick a pair of electrons up onto the oxygen. There were two lone pairs, and now there's three lone pairs on the oxygen. Now finally, we will acidify that. We'll add in some acid, and this will pick up a proton off of the acid. And we have made triphenylmethanol. is our product this week. Now there are other ways to make triphenylmethanol using a green yard, so we're using a ketone this week. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, this is the one we're doing this week, but we could have also done this with an ester. As we've discussed in lecture, esters also work, so let's take a look at that. could have been anything out here because that's going to be a leaving group anyway with the oxygen but we have a phenyl on this one side and if we react this one with the same green yard that we prepared the phenyl magnesium bromide the only difference is I'll need two equivalents of that phenyl magnesium bromide Still do the reaction in diethyl ether and hydrous. So the green yard, same as before, attacks the carbonyl, kicks the electrons up onto the oxygen. Now, any t as we've talked about in lecture, any time we kick electrons up onto the oxygen of a carbonyl, we need to always look and see, can they kick back in and reform the carbonyl if we have a leaving group? Let's see what we have. Here to the left, carbon-carbon bond, not gonna break yet. Electron shared very evenly there. Same thing to the bottom, carbon-carbon, nope. Here to the right, carbon-oxygen bond. Electrons are already being pulled that direction anyway because oxygen is so electronegative. So it's easy to kick that off. So if you look, we've just made benzophenone. 
which is what we're starting with this week. So, of course, that goes ahead and reacts with more of the phenyl magnesium bromide, just like I had up there had up there a moment ago. You can finish out the, the mechanism on your own. That's what we were starting with this week. But I just wanted to show you could also start with an ester. We don't have to start there at the ketone. It's just if we start with the ester, we would need two equivalents of the green yarn. <clears throat> okay, let's take a quick look at our procedure this week. And I have a couple of things to point out. Now, first thing I want to point out is there in the lab, there are two different bottles of diethyl ether. One says anhydrous, and it has a septum on the top. One says diethyl ether, says for extraction and washing purposes. Don't get those confused. On your procedure, your procedure is two pages, and I purposely put it two pages, everything on the first page, you must use the anhydrous diethyl ether. When you get to the second page, then you can use the other diethyl ether. This one has water in it. Notice there's no septum on this, so water has gotten in. That septum is on there for a reason. This is anhydrous, we put the septum, so it's never exposed to the air. You know, here in Mississippi, we are so humid, it will pick up water very quickly, as humid as we are. Now, if there, if, so you'll take a syringe to draw up your ether. Now, however much you need, go ahead and pull the syringe out. So if it says a half, what does it say? Half a mil, probably, yeah, half a mil. Draw up a half a mil of air, first of all. Take and inject, I mean, stick your needle in, right, stick it right in the center, straight down. Push that in. Push in a half a mil of air. And then draw up your half a mil of solvent. Now, if your needle is not touching the solvent, then just flip the bottle upside down and draw out a half a mil of solvent. Now, the reason I put that half a mil of air in there is if everybody is coming in here with a needle straight, with the plunger down and you stick it in and you're pulling out a half a mil and the next person pulls out a half a mil and next one and so on and so forth you're going to create a vacuum inside of that um, inside of the bottle because it's sealed it's going to create a vacuum and then eventually somebody's going to have trouble pulling their half a mil out you have such a vacuum you just can't pull it out so put that always put in the exact same amount of air in there that you're going to pull out as a liquid then that matches the volume and then there's no vacuum okay so again use the one with the septum says anhydrous on the first page do not take my septum off I had a student do that one year I don't know how she got it off they're wired on somehow I had a student one semester was able to pull that off of there somehow with their fingers so don't do that <clears throat> okay, so when you get into the lab, um, get a septum, one of the white septum out of your kit. Go back there to the uh, oven in the back of the lab, and either your instructor or your lab assistant will get you a dry um, reaction tube, and we'll put the septum on there for you because it's going to be hot. Let that reaction tube cool before you open it up to put anything in. Uh, so let it cool completely to room temperature. You're also built, going to be given a vial. Let that cool before you use it. Once it's cooled down, then you can go ahead and put in the magnesium. You can quickly take off the septum, put your magnesium in and put the septum back on. Try to limit the amount of time that it's opened to the atmosphere. Uh, reading on down, I think the rest of that's pretty self-explanatory following along. Now, um, I 
Step six. Once you get to step six. So you're going to place, once you've drawn up your solution, you've got everything added to your uh, vial, you're going to pull all that up into the vial and then into your reaction tube through your septum of your reaction tube. Uh, you'll take that syringe needle, stick it through, and you're going to inject 0.1 milliliters of the bromobenzene solution that you have prepared. So if you read along, I didn't cover that part, but if you read along, you can follow along there. That's straightforward. You're going to put in 0.1 milliliters of the bromobenzene solution. Do not put any more than that. Put 0.1. Now you're going to have a whole syringe full, but you're only going to add 0.1 at this point. If you add the whole thing, it's going to get out of control and everything's going to squirt out on you. It's a very vigorous reaction. You'll have lots of bubbling and everything. So put only 0.1 milliliters. Uh, flick the reaction tube. If the reaction does not start, and it's probably not going to, um, our magnesium that we have there in the lab is a little bit old. It's a couple years, some I bought a couple years ago. So over time it air oxidizes and it has a little coating of magnesium oxide on the outside. So if the reaction does not start, you should see lots of bubbles if it is starting. If it does not start, you don't see any bubbles, then uh, go to your instructor. We're going to grind it for you to knock off some of that magnesium oxide. We're going to use a dry glass stirring rod to crush it a little bit, knock some of that coating, magnesium oxide coating off of the magnesium, and then it'll get started. <clears throat> okay, so rest of that you can follow along. You're going to take, uh, so the bubbling is going to start, it's going to start bubbling in your reaction tube. Let's say this is your reaction tube, I didn't bring one in here with me. Uh, so you're going to have start bubbling there, you got your septum on top. You have a vent needle in you got to have somewhere for it's bubbling you're getting all that gas you got to have somewhere for the gas to go so you got to have a vent needle as well and you'll have your syringe still stuck in there so you still got the bromobenzene solution remember we only added 0.1 but the rest of it's still in the syringe now as the bubbling starts to slow down with your syringe just add just a little bit more and it'll bubble back up again add like another 0.1 mils and it'll bubble back up again and start bubbling real crazy. And then as it starts to slow down, add about another 0.1 and keep going until you've added the entire bromobenzene solution. It'll keep bubbling and keep bubbling. Now, while it's in here, while you're adding that, you want to wrap the top. I forgot to mention that. It's in the procedure. You want to wrap the top with a wet paper towel around the top. So this is an exothermic reaction generating heat. And you're gonna if you don't wrap around the top with a wet paper towel what the purpose of that is is as the ether evaporates it's gonna come up and hit this cooler area you got that wet paper towel on the outside that's gonna cool that area that will condense your ether and let it fall back in so you don't evaporate all your ether so make certain you got a wet paper towel around the top now when the bubbling has you've added all of the bromobenzene solution and the bubbling is almost completely stopped. Uh, it will, it will never completely stop. You will see little bubbles for the rest of the day if you stand there and watch it. But it's going there are going to be little tiny bubbles. It will almost completely stopped, and the majority of your magnesium will be gone. We're using a, a, a little bit of extra magnesium, so. The majority of it will be gone, but there'll be a little magnesium left in there, but not much. Now, at this point, after you've finished step 10, we have made the green yard reagent. And then down here in part two is where we're actually doing the green yard reaction. So follow along on that. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, on the second page, again, once you get to the second page, uh, you no longer have to use the anhydrous, you can use the other ether. And also, once you get to the second page, you no longer need the septum on your reaction tube. So you can take your septum off at this point because once we get to the second page, the grain yard reaction is completed 
and all we have left to do is add the proton. So we're going to add some acid. So whether it gets the proton from some acid or it gets it from some water from the air, it does not matter. So it, we don't does not matter if, if 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 it's open to the atmosphere at this point. Now cool that reaction tube. Says there in step five, cool it in an ice bath and add two mils of three molar hydrochloric acid drop wise. Notice it says drop wise. So drop wise, just a slow, just add, maybe add two or three drops and then you need to mix it really well. Uh, I should have wrote that in the procedure. Add that in there. Step five, as you're adding that three molar hydrochloric acid drop wise, be certain you mix really well after every few drops. Mix it all the way down to the bottom of the reaction tube. You need to get that acid. If you're adding the acid in, it's going to be at the top of the reaction tube. That acid needs to get all the way down to the bottom. Not only will it protonate our, our organic molecule, it's also going to dissolve any excess magnesium that's in the bottom. That hydrochloric acid will dissolve that magnesium. So you should not see any magnesium metal down there. But you got to get... Um, get it mixed, get the acid all the way down to the bottom. So slowly add a little hydrochloric acid, mix it really well, add a couple more drops, mix really well, keep going until it's all uh, mixed and you've added all the two mils of the hydrochloric acid. So you should have a white precipitate that's, form that's formed at this time. Uh, step six, it says add a, e a volume of ether to dissolve the white solid. Uh, you may or may not have a white solid at this point. It depends on how good a job that you did with your wet paper towel keeping the ether from evaporating. If you didn't have any ether evaporate, then you're probably not going to see the white precipitate and you don't have to add any ether. But if you have a white solid in your reaction tube at this point, then you need to add some ether enough to just to dissolve that white solid. Okay, so you got there, after that, you've got some layers to separate. You've separated layers before, and it's got going through, and you've got to dry the ether layer and all of that. You've done all of that before, and then we eventually evaporate off the ether, and then you're going to recrystallize it from 2-propanol, and you've done all that last semester. You know how to do those things. Uh, at some point there, at the very end, you'll, you'll have crystals. Step 14, you'll collect those on a Hirsch funnel. You'll weigh those. You will... Uh, calculated percent yield, you will obtain a melting point and an IR spectra. I know that's a lot to do. Uh, this is a very lengthy procedure, but you know, try to divide this some of this up with between you and your lab partner. One of you can be doing the melting point while one of you go and does the IR spectra. Okay, so I will provide you with an IR spectra of the starting material, and so you can compare the spectra of your product that you obtain to the starting material. You should not see any of those peaks in there. Uh, those peaks should, starting material should be gone and you should have a different uh, spectrum. So compare those, talk about those in your conclusions, in your lab report. Also there's two post lab questions. Just stick those at the end of your lab report. We'll be fine or somewhere in your lab report. Uh, we will find them. Uh, just answer those questions. They're very easy. I've already answered them for you if you paid attention to my lecture here. Okay, so at any point in this lab, if you're not certain what to do, please ask. Like I said, it's a very lengthy lab. You will be there the full time this week. I promise you it will take the full lab period. So you will have to work diligently.